Welcome to the broadcast. We're concluding our series titled Turning Point. Today, our focal point will be on the Philippian Jello. Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16, and we'll begin reading at verse 22 down to verse 31. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many scribes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stalks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. May God add a blessing to the hearers of his red word. Please keep your Bibles handy. We want to point out a few things this morning in the lesson. First of all, you know we started in verse 22 where it started with that preposition then. So that make us know that something happened prior to this. Indeed, Paul and Silas was ministering and all behold, this demon-possessed girl kept following them round town and kept just, you know, chanting, chanting, chanting and all before them. And although they gave a true statement, saying in verse 17, if you note, she said, these men are the servants of the most high God. That was a true statement. But she kept on following and annoying them and was an interruption to their ministering. So Paul had enough and he cast the demon out of her. Well, her owners didn't like that because she was the money machine. What do you mean by that? They was profiting from what she was doing. That's right, just like Madam Lisa and all these folks, all these tarot readings and these palm readings and tablet cards and all this that folks uh, use these mediums today. They even got networks on television and all. And people pay big money because they want to know the future. They want to know the situation. And not knowing all this stuff is just false. Demonic spirits is just false. 
uh, want to contact their relatives and all. But these are imposters. These are demonic spirits. And Paul had enough. He cast the devil out of her. And those owners are so upset because Paul and Silas no ruined their business. Took them, according to verse 20, and brought them to the magistrates and said, falsely accusing now, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So this is what brought us to verse 2.22 because they was arrested. They was falsely accused and the multitude rose up against them and brought them against them to the magistrates and the magistrates tore Paul and Silas clothes. And did you know they beat them with rods. Oh, that had to hurt children. And then, that's bring us to our main character. Verse 23. And they, when they had laid many scrapes on them, they threw them into prison and they commanded the jailer, the Philippian jailer here, uh, to keep them securely. That was his assignment. Can you imagine? He on his job. And all behold, having received such a charge, according to verse 24, he put them into the inner prison. So he had already got them to prison, but because this charge that he received to keep them securely, in other words, don't let these two fellas escape. He took them in the prison to a place called the inner prison. This was a place almost like a little dungeon. A place also where they could torture you and, and, and nobody, nobody. You understand what I'm saying? So then when he get them in the inner prison, he put them or tie them and put their feet into the stocks. Praise God. Oh, but that, that, that wasn't enough when you're dealing with the power of a living God. Suddenly, praise God, Paul and Silas began to not pout. They didn't went to complaining and grumbling like so many of us do. But according to verse 25, at midnight, oh hallelujah, can you imagine? See, at midnight, some folks go out and do all sorts of evil and get in trouble. But Paul and Silas, at midnight, they begin to pray. They begin to sing hymns. Oh, praise God. Hymns to God. They And they weren't quiet about it. They son so that the scripture said the prisoners in the prison was listening to them. You know, I question so many times, I wonder what they were singing. Was they singing amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I I found was blind, but now I see. I don't know what they were singing, but they were singing so that it reached heaven. Oh, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, look at verse 26. Suddenly, suddenly, there was a great earthquake. It shook the foundations of of the prison. Oh, it shook so that all the doors in the prison were open. It shook so that all the chains that was on the prisoners' feet and hands 
was loose. Praise God. And you know they got that new movie called Elvis. And they talk that Elvis sang that song Jailhouse Rock. But I want you to know the original song, praise God, is here in Acts 16. Paul and Silas created that, praise God, because as they was singing and those hymns to God, oh, the jailhouse shook, hallelujah, jailhouse rock, oh, hallelujah, do you see it, do you see it this morning, he shook the foundations, oh, praise God, of the jailhouse, God did it, God did it, he can shake the foundations wherever you are. He can shake whatever got a hold of you. Oh, children, he can shake it loose. Oh, hallelujah. Look at the power of a living God. And the keeper of the prison, come on, look at verse 27. The keeper of the prison, he awakened all oh, out of his sleep. You know, he was sleeping on the job. Oh, but when the jailhouse shook, he woke up. Oh, hallelujah. He got up then. Oh, hallelujah. And all behold, seeing the prison doors open. And he supposing the prisoners had fled. And you remember that charge he had to keep them securely? Well, all behold, he supposed and he had in his mind that they had escaped and they had ran to safety. And supposing they had fled, he drew his sword to kill himself. That's right. He was about to commit suicide. You know, the suicidal rate is up in this country. See, folks, rather than face the problem, before they will seek help, before they will reach out to the true and living God. See, some of them don't want no shame because of what they're going through. They don't want no repercussion. Uh, they don't want people to know their friends and family uh, that they let them down. You know, they had put themselves on a big pedestal and they did not arrive where, where all that they were seeking for. And but instead of dealing with shame, instead of being embarrassed, they rather commit suicide. Here this man, instead of being old, accused and experiencing the shame that he allowed his prisoners to escape. Guess what he did? He had him as my, I take my sword and I kill myself and then when they find me dead and my sword uh, in my chest or what have you, they will say, praise God, he was a hero. He got killed in the line of duty. Oh, and now he'll be buried in honor, praise God, instead of shame. But oh, thank God for the Apostle Paul. Thank God for Silas. Oh, Paul cried out. Did you see it? In verse 28, Paul called with a loud voice, there ain't no time to be silent. He saw that this man was in danger of taking his own life. He said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. We haven't escaped all the prisoners, and just think about it, all the other prisoners who stocks was loose. They change fell off. But look at the miraculous power of God. Nobody escaped. They were shocked, even themselves. They was trying to gather their thoughts and figure out what was going on that early in the morning. They couldn't figure out why the prison was shaking Oh, and the earthquake. They didn't understand. Oh, but they were spellbound. 
Oh, but Paul told that jailer, Sir, do thyself no harm. I'm saying to each of you this morning that's going through a situation, oh, challenging things that have met you face to face, do thyself no harm. There is a God that loves you. There is a God that care about you. And he can turn it around this morning. Will you call on him? Oh, hallelujah. Well, what did the jailer do? Look at verse 29. He then called for a light. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, he called for a light. You know, Jesus is the light of the world. He ran in, that's right, into the inner prison, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then he brings them out. You see it there in verse 30. And he said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Oh, hallelujah. See, faith come by hearing. You say, well, what did he hear? Praise God. Let's go back to chapter 16, verse 17. Oh, it's right there in that verse. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim, listen to me, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. They was preaching Christ and Him crucified. They was preaching the good news. They was preaching about the gospel, how Jesus has come to save. They was preaching concerning Jesus' birth. They was preaching concerning Jesus' death. They was preaching about Jesus' resurrection and that he yet lives and he can turn your life around. Oh, so he had already heard that these men were proclaiming, oh, the salvation message, praise God. They knew the true and living God. So that's why he cried out in verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Oh, hallelujah. Will you cry out this morning? Don't you want to know what must you do to be saved? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a simple process. People try to complicate it. Organizations try to complicate it. Churches begin to complicate it. It's nothing complicated about it. Jesus came and all oh, by him coming oh, to this earth. Oh, praise God. And a body like you and I, but well, without sin, no gall in his mouth. He was sinless, but became sin for us. But I want you to know he took your sin. He took my sin. And oh, he nailed it to his cross. And he paid the ransom in full. And he got up the third day with all power in his hand. I want you to know, praise God. Oh, when he cried out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Jesus made this way easy. Paul knew about it. Why? Because on last week we told you how Paul turning point was on the road to Damascus when Jesus met him and turned his life around. So Paul now tells him, oh, the easy formula to know Jesus. Oh, not all this stuff. It ain't no 12-step program. No, sir. It ain't you got to go through all this initiation and you got to follow all these rules and regulations. No. Away with that foolishness. Paul and Silas give this man the way to Jesus and he said, believe. Look, look, look at verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you will be saved, you and your household. Why we complicate the matter? Why we make it difficult? It's easy. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come and learn of me. Jesus invited you to accept him this morning. His way is easy. Believe, praise God. You recall, as you will know, praise God, in the Gospel of John, in John, that beloved disciple, he tells us in chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, and truly Jesus did many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, John say, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, listen to me, y'all, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you want to live today, if you want life, I'm talking about real life, a life of Peace and joy is in Jesus Christ. So Paul told him the simple way to, to God, the simple way to Jesus, the simple way for salvation. He said, all you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And not only you, but your household. Oh, praise God. I'm so glad, praise God, that I recall what is written by Paul when Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And he wrote it, praise God, it's recorded in Romans 10, verse 8 and 10. And it said, but what does it say? Well, I'm glad you asked. What does it say? Well, he going to tell us. The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart. One believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Oh, that is in the word. Oh, hallelujah. So what did this Philippian jailer do? Praise God. The scripture declares. Look at verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved, you and your household. And you read on, praise God. He and his household was saved. Oh, hallelujah. This was the jealous turning point. Can you imagine? This wasn't in the church. Hallelujah. This wasn't in the church, children. This was on the job. That's right. He was on the job. And as he witnessed the miraculous work of God, he felt when the earthquake shook the prison. He saw all the prisoners' chains was loose and no one escaped. He saw the prison doors all inside of all those cells open. And he knew this was very strange. Somebody trying to get my attention. I ask you this morning, what will it take? What will it take to get your attention? Well, believe me, have you considered the situation that you're facing now? God has allowed you to be in this place where you can see him. That's right. 
certain things are ordered by the Lord to motivate us to make a change. To make a change in the direction we're going. The Lord is saying to you, today you need to turn. You need to call on my name. You need to confess with your mouth. The Lord Jesus. Invite me into your life. Your heart. And you can be saved this morning. The jailer if you read on. I'm, I'm concluding but. You read on in Acts there, it's chapter 16. It turned this jealous life around. This jealous received Jesus Christ. And guess what? He went on home. Took Paul and Silas there. And just as Paul and Silas stated. Boy, if you just believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household will be saved. We see him and his household were saved. What about your household? Some of you said, child, it's in a, it's in a hot mess. Well, the Lord can deliver you. He can save your household this morning. This jello. That's right. He called out to these preachers. And he cried out, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, quick response. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about it. This was the number one thing that Billy Graham would preach in all his revival meetings all over the world. And that was John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. Will you believe this morning? Will you say yes to his will, yes to his way, and come and be part of the family of God? Don't put it off. Do it today and remember to give thanks. And before we conclude today, I want to thank God for all my supporters. And to all my cousins, praise God, cousin Elnora, praise God, and 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 all the others, um, Billy Boy and different ones, uh, Sister Judy and different ones who follow this broadcast. We appreciate you. We thank you, and let us be ready next week as we start a new series. And please remember to give thanks.